you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you all for coming. Um, my name's Anne Dotter. I direct the honors program and contribute to the Multicultural Programming Advisory Council by asking questions and on occasion being put to work, organizing and facilitating a conversation like the one we're having today. Um, MPAC is dedicated to multicultural education and cultural diversity. The council hosts events such as this one and financially supports student groups and campus units invested in multicultural programming. In light of our mission, then I want to start by reminding us all that Johnson County Community College stands on the homeland of Native American peoples at the juncture of Missouri and Kansas rivers. In recent years, these nations have included Missouria, Odo, Kansas, Osage, Shawnee, and Delaware. As Americans, we also live in a, count, in a country built on the labor of enslaved people, in a county named after Thomas Johnson, a white man who brought his enslaved people to the area when establishing the Shawnee Mission. We pay respect to all Black, Indigenous, and all people of color, past, present, and future. And considering last week's mass murders in and around Atlanta, I want us to hold in our thoughts members of the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities in particular. So before I introduce our guests, my co-conspirator, Dr. Christy Howell, um, will make a few housekeeping announcements. Thank you, Anne. Um, today's event is being recorded in gallery view, which means that only our participants are available in that record or visible in that recording. Um, all attendees are in listen only mode. So when we're ready for Q&A, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, all the way to the right, you'll see a couple of little chat bubbles. And that's how you can ask questions in Q&A. Um, you can ask your questions anonymously if you'd like. That's fabulous. You can also upvote and reply to questions as they come up in Q&A. You are enthusiastically encouraged to interact with each other in the question and answer box. If you have tech issues, feel free to chat at me and I will try to walk you through those. Um, I'm, I may be able to, I may not be able to. Um, I should show up in your chat as Christy Howe. I may show up as sustainability. Either way, yell at me if you have trouble. Um, if you are attending for extra credit, I knew I was going to forget something. Please put your name and the faculty member for whose class you're attending in the chat and I'll make sure that, that gets taken care of. And now I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> and I'm going to pick back up. Um, so following uh, Christy's recommendation, I really encourage you all to be putting questions in chats. We're going to be spending about 40 minutes or so talking about questions that were prepared by members of MPAC. So um, mostly staff and faculty, but on occasions students um, contribute as well. And then we'll close with focusing, leaving 15 minutes, um, we hope, to all of your questions. So please contribute. Um, but joining us today, I am really thrilled to welcome two wonderful scholars who have thought a lot about questions of race, racism, um, and colonialism across the globe. Um, Professor Cécile Laxilien chairs the Interdisciplinary Studies Department at Kennesaw State University. Her many publications contribute to the field of Francophone, African, and Caribbean literatures and cultures. She is particularly interested in gender issues in Caribbean literature, um, in Caribbean cultural expressions, sorry, um, and literature, but also film and visual culture. Professor Glenn Adams teaches in the psychology department at the University of Kansas. He has done extensive field work in Ghana, which is the basis for his research on the cultural psychological foundation of relationships. He currently investigates the coloniality of knowledge in psychological science. And so without further ado, I'm excited to jump in this conversation with a question that I um, asked professors Axilien and Adams to ponder ahead of time. And the question was, what do you wish lay people understood about race and colonialism? Who wants to start? I don't think we have identified a, <laughs> an opener. C 
Cecile, would you like to go ahead? Um, sure. I mean, I think I would like people to understand that this is a reality. This is what I and many other people of color experience every day. I think sometimes people think, oh, it's not that bad. You know, they're just making it up. They're exaggerating. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have real relationship with other people of color, I'm not talking about just we colleagues, we talk, we nice. I'm talking about very deep relationship where we have conversations, then you will no longer have the luxury of thinking that this is not real. I'll stop here. <laughs> Gwen. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation. It's a, a humbling, um, experience but an important occasion and so uh, I feel you know a responsibility to add to the conversations to the extent that I can and what I would say in answer to your question is the first thing is that colonialism is not something in the past uh, colonialism lives on uh, some people talk about it living on in this idea of coloniality which you can think of as ways of thinking and being, especially uh, value, valuations around race or the way that uh, race becomes uh, a way of organizing the world. But the, it, it lives on past colonialism it, and uh, characterizes the modern order, the way the world is set up, the way international organizations work, the way laws work, the way we organize universities the way we think uh, a good way to be is. These ways of thinking and being, they had their root in uh, the colonial period, but they live on. So we live in a colonial present. The present is still a colonial present. Colonialism hasn't gone away, it's still colonial. And it, it exists, when I say coloniality, it's really a racialized form of living. And it exists in many things that we generally think of as positive. Uh, so even things like the, the European Enlightenment, for example, if you're in uh, humanities classes, you learn about the Enlightenment and things like reason. Uh, but um, there are ways in which uh, th those ways of being emerged in a period of colonialism and they reflect that kind of colonialism. And, and we don't have time to, to get into it, but maybe it will come up in the questions. But that would be the primary thing that racism and coloniality, colonialism is not over. We live in a colonial present. Racism permeates the modern order. And because of that, um, and this is sort of uh, um, building on ideas of um, Professor Kendi, uh, uh, who has talked about how to be an anti-racist. You may have encountered that book, but or, or speaks about anti-racism. Uh, anti-racism, not non-racism, that it's, that is because racism permeates the everyday reality that we inhabit, if one just goes through one's life without considering it, then one is actually contributing to its reproduction. In order to stop its reproduction, one simply cannot simply be non-racist. It's impossible. One has to work in ways that uh, oppose it. And I think those are the things that I would emphasize along with one final thing, which is that we all have a responsibility to act. And one might think that it's not one's place you know, uh, to, to, or there isn't very much one can do because one doesn't come from a certain, what one isn't of a positionality that uh, racism touches. But we, because we reproduce it through an action, that means failing to know and failing to consider uh, the presence and work of racism means that we reproduce as if we're not considering. And so it's our responsibility to educate ourselves by going outside the boundaries of what we normally encounter in the university and our everyday lives to uh, read and engage uh, and educate ourselves about uh, the world in a way that we don't always get the 
uh, support or encouragement to do. It takes active steps, in other words, and it's our responsibility to do it. Thank you. Um, so your statements, um, Professor Adams, lend themselves really well into our first question, our second question, I should say. Um, we thought about the interview that recently was given to Oprah by Prince Andrew and Meghan Markle. And that led us to think about the many ways in which history tends to repeat itself. And so I wondered if you could comment on how you see historical patterns of race and colonialism play out today. Either of you can take the question. It <laughs> um, I mean, uh, it's really interesting that this interview came after a very successful um, Bridgerton first series because in you and I um, and have had this conversation, I was actually at once shocked, annoyed, you know, disappointed about how Bridgerton represents this pseudo reality. And interestingly, as a scholar of Haitian studies, at the very time they portrayed the queen, there was actually the Haitian queen, the real Haitian queen living in England at that time. And the whole idea of love will conquer all. So for me, I thought this is um, Netflix demonstrating a pseudo reality and Meghan Merkel is living it. But I don't know in a way why people are surprised because the very structure of this monarchy is meant to be gated, to exclude people. And I am not sure I don't follow pop culture enough to think whether more um, Megan identify herself first and foremost as a black woman or see herself as biracial. Maybe if she went um, as clearly I'm a black woman, the conversation may have been different, but it's, it shows that for her husband, he didn't have to deal with this reality until he was married to her and now have a child. And people didn't ask, will the child have red hair? Will the child look more like his mother or his father? It was completely, immediately about race. And to me, that's very telling. We're not in a post-racial society. And I don't know if we're going to be there anytime soon. There's that fear. And that's what we see, the fear of whiteness not being at the center. This is very much a conversation about this attempt to decenter whiteness. Mm -hmm. To me, that's one way I read um, this interview. That's one way I see this whole, this whole thing. And as um, Glenn mentioned before, this further show we're living in a colonial context. We are not in a post-colonial or post-racial. We are in a racialized um, society where race and privilege intertwine constantly. Yeah, I'm um, also not up on all the pop cultural stuff. But for me, the um, big examples of the history repeating itself, uh, when we were watching the mob descend on the US Capitol, mm -hmm. I, um, to me, it was a, and when we hear the discussions about um, securing the vote and voter fraud and um, the measures that uh, different states and locales are um, attempting to implement, these definitely resonate with efforts from the reconstruction in the period following the Civil War when white, uh, white folks tried to reestablish the rule of racial order and engaged in all manner of racial terror to accomplish that end. Uh, and, and this smells like that uh, again, uh, so restricting the vote, but also the 
demonstration at the, 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 the mob uh, riot at the Capitol had a lot of features that um, remind one of a recapitulation of racism in American history. And this is something that, you know, when I would certainly when I was learning American history in high school and, and even in university, the kinds of ideas that we learn about, we don't necessarily always hear the racialized context of them. So freedom and liberty in the American Revolution, we don't hear the, how elements of that were in defense of a certain kind of white supremacy. Uh, the, the colonists wanted to occupy lands beyond the Appalachian Mountains and the, the, the British had signed a treaty uh, forbidding that and the colonists chafed at that. And that was one of the things uh, that, that they wanted to demonstrate against. Um, similarly, issues related to enslavement um, and restrictions and the possibility of a coming abolition. People were wary about that. So these are the kinds of freedoms that people wanted to have. They wanted to be free to continue to oppress in some sense. This is, it, it's a complicated issue. So I, I'm not trying to say that this is entirely 100% everything that people were fighting for, but it, one can't deny that it was present in this mix of things. And um, you may recall that the former occupant of the White House, one of his favorite presidents was uh, Andrew Jackson. He had a, a portrait of Andrew Jackson hanging in the Oval Office. When Andrew Jackson came to power, it was also uh, one of these positioned as a sort of populist and uh, had a party at the White House and um, sort of uh, high society at the time was kind of aghast at the sort of rabble uh, that, that descended on Washington. So there's a similar kind of populist element there, but part of that populist element, again, was about uh, the imposition of a racial order. And um, Jackson represented certain interests of the South. And of course, he instigated the removal of indigenous people from the Southeast, referred to now as the Trail of Tears, and uh, certainly was uh, about the expansion of, the, of what that became the Confederacy. So all of these things are going through my mind when I saw the people in the Capitol, and many of them had um, overtly racist symbols while they were doing it. It's not an incongruent thing. That's what I would end with. This simultaneity of the racist imagery and the freedom fighter revolutionary um, patriotism that we, we, we learn about, those are not inseparable things. They go together. And, and to turn our face away from it is to do ourselves a, a big disservice, to remain ignorant and, uh, and, and support of white supremacy. That leads really well, Glenn, into our next question. Um, so it's really common for folks to think of racism as being uniquely American. And I think it's even more common when we're talking about American history. Um, what are some of the ways that we can work to open our minds to the global realities of racism? I mean, I think people have to do the work. I know this sounds simplistic. You have to read, you have to be willing to learn about other cultures. And I mean, in real ways, not just think, oh, because I like Mexican food or because I like Jamaican food that make me not racist because I watch a film from um, China and I happen to like uh, this particular Chinese food, Chinese American food. I, I think we really have to see that we are part of this world that's complex and where we think differently. And ultimately we also have to agree to disagree. I think this is something, again, it's back to privilege where I see, and we have this conversation even with students, people get so uncomfortable when they're having conversations where they don't agree. And I think this is also a cultural thing, but it's also a privilege. Because for me, as a person of color, for instance, as a parent, I have um, a young child. I have had to have complex conversations 
about racism around the US and around the world with my 10 year old child. I don't have the luxury to not have these conversations. So people have to get out of their comfort zone and realize we don't live in this world that we live in 30 years ago. It's not enough to say, oh, okay, I do want to go um, travel to Guatemala. I want to go to Brazil, to Carnival, yet I don't really want to learn about Brazilian culture. I just want to take the aspect that I think are cute, the aspect of culture that I like. It does not work out this way. And depending on where you are, and people also have to see racism that from the perspectives of intersectionality. Um, it is not just some of the challenges I deal sometimes, it's not just because I'm a black person. Sometimes it's because I'm a black woman. Sometimes it's because I'm a black woman with an accent. Sometimes it's because I'm a black woman from Haiti. So I think the reality of intersectional identities and our positionalities, the context of where we are, I think they are very real. And people want to live in a bubble and they want to have an either or. And that paradigm doesn't work. It's more messy than either or because we are human beings, we are messy. We have complex emotions, we have complex psychology. We have, and, and this is what makes us um, great, but we are these complex machines. Yeah, I think that um, like many things in the United States, uh, my discipline, for example, psychology has a very bad reputation or uh, the point is that much of the field is based on research conducted in the United States. So people build a model of the typical human tendencies based on a small population, not even of people in the United States, but sort of white middle-class college students. Okay, so we have a tendency to think of many things in the United States in terms of Amer as American things. And um, racism is, is one of those things that we tend to think of that in that way. But part of the idea about um, linking racism and colonialism or thinking about coloniality is to realize that the world order, the way the world is right now, is a racist order. The, for 500 years, European powers and European settlers transformed the, the world in their image, resettled in entire places and made them over in the image of Europe with particular ideas attached to it. And those things uh, persist and dominate the world. What we think of as uh, a proper education or the, the kind of ideas that we think of as good ideas those uh, rule the world and determine uh, who gets what. And even more concretely than that, that may run a little bit more toward cultural studies or idealism for some people's taste. But if you wanna talk political economy, uh, there's a very, we often, um, we often talk about, we often look at the, the global order right now and we see poorer countries, impoverished countries, and there's a tendency to blame people in those countries for their own problems. Like why can't these spaces get their act together? Failed states and this kind of discourse. But we often don't note the extent to which the situations of, that people live in were the product of century. They were made, it wasn't, it didn't happen. It was a product of relationship, uh, global relationships. So a, a prominent case, another one you can put in the chat box for people Walter Rodney is a, a name of an author. They might consider how Europe underdeveloped Africa. The idea that the African case you know, is the situation African states find themselves in today is uh, it's not an un, a lack of development, it's an underdevelopment. And making the point that the overdevelopment of our space, the, the way that we, the, the economic privileges, and they are privileges as Professor Asalian said, the privileges in the United States, those are maintained by things like walls, by things like exclusionary policies and developed at, by off-sourcing 
the negative uh, implications of consumption and policy. So there's just even things like trash. So sending boatloads of trash to the Philippines or other spaces, sending waste to Ghana, uh, offloading the negative consequences of the lifestyle and building the lifestyle on the backs of other people, the development of some reduced by the underdevelopment of others. And that's a kind of classic treatment of that case. But even Professor Asselian will know much better than I do, but the case of Haiti is a classic example too, because Haitians won their independence and then um, rather than having the ability to develop, had to uh, pay a crushing, um, I don't know the proper word for it, rep indemnity or some kind of damages to France. And uh, mm -hmm. again, the, the, the ability of some to create, the, to create societies of wealth and affluence came at the expense of others that were not able to do that. That is the modern order. And it was produced through racism. And, and we write that out of the story in most cases when we're talking about American exceptionalism and greatness. Yeah, exactly. And I think we also forget that our borders are very thin. They're very artificial. And borders were created out of power, if we think of the African continent and in the fact that you have whole ethnic group in Ghana that was supposed to be in the Ivory Coast, this is clearly um, colonialism 101. It was, if you look at the borders, just go look at um, what was happening between the French and the German, the German came in late in the game and the British, et cetera. If you look at um, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the borders are very artificial, you know, between France and Spain. And this is part of the reason why we have so many issues. But everything, we have to go back to the idea of power. I mean, I tell students, if you don't remember anything in my classes, all that can be traced back to power. Who wants it? Who has it? And I think what the pandemic has taught us, it's not things that those of us who do this work, colonialism, social justice, we knew that. It just came more to the surface. The pandemic lay bare. The infrastructure, the systemic injustices, whether we're talking about the justice system, education system, and health care system. That's what it has done, but it's, it's nothing new and it's all back to power. Just recently, I was reading in the New York Times um, an article about, about wealth, about how many people of color, they cannot have wealth because they don't have generational wealth and how the very fact that you created a system and that they were not allowed to buy houses in certain area, the government were, supporting whites to buy houses. So you look at a place like New Jersey, so who owned these houses? By the time these blacks, even college educated blacks, myself as an example, I the first time in my career, and I'm a professional with a PhD, I bought a house like about three years ago, the first time in my forties. So imagine, compare me to a colleague who had generational wealth, who maybe their parents gave them twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars to put as a down payment? Meanwhile, I was paying my school loans. I couldn't afford still having three jobs, and I'm very privileged. I'm not saying that to feel sorry for myself, and I realize and acknowledge my privilege. But we need to understand how this is connected. How power wounds everything. It's all connected to power. So compared to somebody else who has who had that power from their parents' generational wealth, then they are more likely to leave more for their kids. And we can take the case of gender because I know people get uncomfortable about race. So I love bringing in gender. Now, the people who are um, in the poverty class, you're looking at children and women over 60 in the US, because you know why? Part of it is that women are generally penalized. They make less than men on average. On, and this goes in every sector. 
um, whether in academia, the healthcare, et cetera, maybe the government is a bit better because of the way they have the structure. So then when these women retired, um, they are less likely to have wealth. And if they get divorced and they have children, so there are all these factors. It's about power. And this is why we have to look at the, the lenses of racism through intersectionality, class, gender, age, etc. cetera. So one of the things I was thinking about listening to you speak um, is one of the bizarre phenomenons that maybe was completely unexpected, but is entirely um, special to France um, that had the race and racism conversation recently and all the ripple effect of the Black um, Matters, Black Lives Matter movements um, in France be pushed aside as yet another um, influence of America or yet another way in which um, American culture negatively impacts um, France, right? So the assumption there was that the French don't have any racism issue, but it is an importation from um, the US. So <laughs> I wonder if maybe you can think of other instances, maybe not necessarily like this, right? Of uh, culture dodging its own um, racist histories um, and hiding behind um, another cultural set of cultural movements outside of the US, but um, other ways in which maybe racism um, might express itself um, outside of the US. We've, we've, we've been very American centered in our conversation so far, and I'm really trying to get us to look outside. <laughs> um, so are, are there maybe, Cecile, you can give us the examples in, in Haiti or in the Caribbean and, and then, um, uh, Cecile, you're muted. Sorry, I just realized that. I mean, I think a lot of it, and we have to talk about colorism because in the space of Haiti, for instance, um, and even in places like Jamaica, um, it's, we cannot, talk about racism per se in terms of the ongoing definition. So we have to talk about um, colorism. And what the colonizers did was leave people with the idea that only what is French or what is British is acceptable, is better. And that continues. So you have, um, in the case of Haiti, maybe 2% of the population who owns the wealth. And the US continue to support that and friends continue to support that in Canada and what have you. So you have that. But in the case of friends, what's interesting is it's this idea like there were no slaves in France's physical territory. So therefore we don't really have that issue. It's those Americans. And it's interesting to me right now, there are movements with the museums that suddenly so many countries, you know, you're talking about the Netherlands, you're talking about um, who are suddenly realizing that, oh my God, we are really racist. <laughs> and then and then you say, well, if you look at your museum, the stuff you have in there, how did you get them? How did you acquire them? In what context did you pay people for them? And what does that mean? You don't have to look for. So there's this movement, but so I think we have to be careful in these countries have had the luxury of saying we never actually have slaves in our territories, even though we have all these, in the case of France, overseas French department, overseas territories, but the physicality of having slaves here make us better than those other people. And I think we have to be careful. We have to be careful of that. But also the discourse in the case of France has been everybody's French. So the Republic, so therefore we don't have to talk about diversity. It doesn't matter if you black, green, purple, you all French, but we know the reality is completely different. Where it's very recently, I think in the like maybe early 2000, for the first time there was an anchor from Martinique and everybody was like, oh, this is awesome. And I'm like, no, this is a shame. 
Martinique and Guadeloupe and Réunion, they have been part in other islands, have been part, they are supposedly French on paper. So why are we celebrating that now there is one um, <laughs> one black person on national television who's telling us the news and we're celebrating that. It's a shame. No, oh, Glenn, go ahead. Oh, you were going, you were going to say something? Go ahead. No, 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 please. Well, I was, I was just going to try to respond to your question again. And I think there were a couple different parts to it. Maybe one question is just generally trying to get back to examples of racism globally. Um, and, and I'll return to that. Well, but then the other one was a little bit about the racism denial in the French case. And that reminded me a little bit of the South African case. It's hard to deny racism in the South African case, of course. I mean, it's hard to deny racism in the American case. We do the same kind of thing. It's like, okay, well, it happened in the past, yes. And tend to minimize the, the how, how bad it was and minimize its effect on the present, but there's sort of an idea of a, a kind of transformation. And in the South African case, the kind of this notion of the rainbow nation or a very multicultural space. And, and, in, and this becomes important because it's important to think about in terms of the globe as well. Of course, the globe is a very diverse place, a culturally diverse place. And so we can say that engaging that cultural diversity is somehow makes us not racist or that racism is sort of antithetical to racism. But you can see in, in the South African case, now the considerations that you, you hear people saying is that that sort of multiculturalism or discussion of the rainbow nation is a kind of a screen, a screen to um, prevent people really from thinking about how, yes, there's a certain kind of different flavors. You can sample different flavors of the nation. And, but at the end of the day, some are, have more opportunities than others. Uh, school placement and land and all kinds of tangible resources or power are distributed unequally, even though people may be, yes, very happy to uh, embrace uh, and, and valorize and applaud each other and maybe even invite each other to dinner, although I wouldn't push it uh, that, that far. But still, um, I think that that can be a, a screen that prevents us from seeing the way that whiteness and white supremacy still rule the international space. And even where, even where you wouldn't expect to find whiteness and white supremacy, you can go to Ghana and see how whiteness and white supremacy reign, not necessarily because even in the case of people who are called white there, but the way that people understand uh, what makes people attractive, what makes people understand what they want to strive for in life or what constitutes a good relationship or a good marriage. And one of the more recent pieces of research, I'm just mentioning it just because it's on the top of my head. My colleagues and I are looking at the way people think, what, what is love? What does love look like? And there's a kind of disnification or romanticization of the concept of love that orients people toward this very close, mutually involved, interpenetrating emotional connection, but at the expense of a lot of other important connections that, um, and the point is that, that these different kinds of love emerge from different kinds of senses about person in relation to community. And by emphasizing one as the right way to be, the healthy way to be, and it's not just like in psychology that we do this, magazines, television, and the, the sort of US or European models of how to do these things coming into many countries and people believe come to believe that this is naturally better uh, without thinking about some of the downsides that those models present, people who are left out, people who are lonely. Um, again, Professor Selian said uh, a good example, the, the, the people who are impoverished are often uh, elderly women, for example. This is partly about the models of care and family that this heterosexual um, nuclear family arrangement engenders. Um, so that's a kind of, I, I would like to think about that as a manifestation of racism and a kind of white supremacy. Well, yeah, and speaking from a personal experience as a woman um, who I've had my hair natural, 
like most of my life, I have gotten pushback from people because I don't fit the ideal beauty, which is European. You're supposed to have wavy hair. Um, even when I remember when I live um, in um, Burkina Faso in West Africa, I was teaching American literature. And then um, students will come to me like, why do you have your hair like that? And many of them in like a hundred plus degree heat will have these, um, these wigs. And I will challenge them because it was that this is the idea of beauty. And it's very recently, probably the past five years or so that it's more accepted in certain spaces to have natural hair. I have um, friends who work in corporate America. They envy me because depending on their position, they could not go without having the ideal idea of what um, quote unquote good hair is. And um, the hair industry is, is huge because of this idealization. And this is directly connected to whiteness, to centering whiteness, to racism and to, and to colonialism. And um, what is beauty and the lighter skin you are, putting more milk in your coffee, so to speak, the more you have certain privilege and you consider quote unquote beautiful. And we see that, we see people sadly bleaching their skin. And this is not just on the African continent, this is also um, in India, this is you know, throughout Asia. Uh, so the, the idea of like racism and how it manifests itself is all around the globe, based on whomever said that quote unquote white skin was better and so many other countries and cultures, they brought that and they're trying to center whiteness in their way of doing things, the idea thinking, you know, even if we think about space and the pandemic has had us think more about space and how we live in community or how we don't live in community. You know, I mean, it is sad, for instance, I remember reading that, in England, there was a minister of loneliness, you know, because people were so lonely and the pandemic um, has made that come to life because we no longer live in community. And this is all these values of what is ideal, these European, Eurocentric, Western, global, not whatever term you want, tell us this is what success means. And that has implication. Success equals being closer to whiteness, whether it's in your appearance, whether it's in the kind of car you drive, whether it's in the space that you have. And you, when we're no longer thinking about our local cultures and the importance of those cultures. Whenever I go to Haiti, it's being a while, I get so mad. Instead of people eating local fruits and vegetables, they're eating things that are processed that I don't even eat in the US and they're offering them to me. I get so angry. I'm like, go get me a mango from the mango tree. Go get me an avocado, you know? But it's to show a lot of time the sign of they are doing well. This is all terrific and very exciting and we could proceed going down this line, but. In closing, because we only have 15 minutes left and so far no questions in chat, right, Christy? One question. Um, we have two questions in Q&A um, and I'm happy to, would you like for me to go ahead and read one of them and let, let's go down that rabbit hole? Sure. Okay. Um, wow, now we have three questions in Q&A. So um, let's do the first one. Do you think racism will ever come to an end? No. Uh, and, and I don't want to be, I, I want to be realistic. And I feel bad saying that because, you know, students, young, because I think so many people don't think it's real. So many people just see it as black and white. They think, oh, well, I don't, I say hello to my black neighbor. I'm not racist. When I go to a restaurant, I see the server, I'm nice to them. They're not probing into the little acts every day. They're not looking into changing the systemic structure 
that's creating racism because people don't want to give up their power and privilege until we are ready to have that until we have that conversation and think about Gandhi saying there's enough for everyone's needs, but not enough for everyone's greed until we remove that fear because it's about power and privilege. We have to start these conversations. I mean, I live in a state right now where we're getting pushed back. Some of the classes in my, um, that, in my department the state, um, some legislature has asked for us to send a list and we're getting pushed back those of us who have classes where we're teaching things about power and privilege. And frankly, it's because I'm sure um, white people, many of them are scared. They think if you're teaching about power and privilege, that means you're anti-white. And I'm like, no, it's saying that we live in this world whether we're talking about climate change whether we're talking about healthcare, what affects me affects all of us. And when we're not, until we're ready to have that real conversation, and I don't know if we're really going to learn the lesson of the pandemic, that we live in this world where we are interconnected organically. If we can't start with that, then racism is not gonna end. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Glenn, do you wanna take a stab at it? Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, what I would say is that it seems like um, it would be very difficult to say that one is going to sort of eradicate racism at any particular time. And then even if one, if the, the danger having done it, if one ever did it, is that the recurrence could be very, easy um, that uh, people can, re it can re reinstantiate itself quite, quite easily. It, it ebbs and flows in different manifestations. It's very adaptive. Um, the, the way by which people maintain that, that power, the way they deploy racialization to maintain their power. And it is about maintaining and power and, and to build up, build upon uh, Professor Celian's points again, uh, the, uh, the, the thing is that people are investing in this thing that ultimately kills them. And some of you may have read just one example of a book that you might read by uh, Metzl. I forget if it's Jonathan or John or something Metzl, but it's Dying of Whiteness, I think is the name of the book, but it just gives, there's even a chapter about Kansas. He was born in Kansas City and went to school in Kansas City, but he's writing about the ways in which uh, people, white people invest in systems and politics uh, based on the kind of racialization, based on the desire to maintain a sort of racial superiority that ultimately are not good for them either. Um, and uh, I was thinking some of the same ideas related to our discussion of, of food. Uh, I mean, there are ways in which the Eurocentrism of the world is definitely a detriment to everybody who inhabits it. Climate change is, is a big example, but this, but even more to the point of, of racial power and its uh, deployment. Uh, things like healthcare, the, the gun debate. Um, we have a lot of unhealthy situations in the United States that impinge on everybody's well-being and they're in place because people think it's necessary to protect their racial privilege. Can you see? Do you want me to go ahead and do the next one, Anne, or can you see them? Uh, yeah, I can see them, but you can go ahead. Maybe Allison's. Yeah. Um, so this one's um, a little long, so I'm happy to dissect it if I need to. Um, racism in the Netherlands is an especially complicated topic. When visiting the Netherlands, one sees very, very few locals of African descent. Yet, as Dr. Asien alluded to, so many major sites um, so many major sites of tourists typically visits were funded by the slave trade. Do you have any idea if there are efforts to educate visitors on this historical reality? So sort of the question of contextualization of monuments, but in a, in a more global sense. Yeah, and I mean, the Netherlands have um, colonies 
you know, I'm not politically correct in the Caribbean. Dutch St. Martin, you know, if we take off um, Curaçao, so there's a whole colonial history with the Netherlands, we just don't hear about it. But I think what's happening now, and I can't think of the name of the museum, but I can send it to um, Professor Doter that they are working on trying to bring programs via the museum. So they're starting to have this, these conversations. It's slow, but it's a start about um, their, colonial, their colonial past. But again, I think people are scared and this is why it's so important for us to teach history. I mean, I for one, for instance, take, um, I have mixed feelings about the idea of like black history month. It should be history throughout all the months. I think it's a cop out. So by the same token, I think European countries should be teaching about their colonial past. Um, it's not beautiful, but most history is, is not beautiful. They, they need to be, it needs to be an integral part of, um, of students' knowledge. And that's the way we can, that's the way we can, um, we can learn. Why is it that I had to learn about French history? I went to school. We have to learn about like all this. Why is it, um, why aren't French kids forced to learn about Haiti. We were, Haiti was France's richest colony, um, you know, in the um, 18th century. So I think we need to start there. All this curriculum needs to be revisited. To me, until you do that, you are not serious. Before the pandemic, I had the occasion to be at uh, Groningen University in uh, the Netherlands for a conference on racism and, and diversity. It wasn't framed as that, but the the, the, it was a celebration of diversity, but the organizers uh, wanted to bring up the point that diversity, uh, that, that the, the country is less diverse than it imagined and it had a racist history that tended to, that people tended to overlook. And I think this is an opportunity to make an important point, which is that one of the ways that racism uh, operates in the, in the world that we inhabit uh, the world that we inhabit is the denial of racism. That's one of the prominent manifestations that it has right now, where you have uh, people saying that it's a thing of the past, it wasn't that big a deal, it was a long time ago, or other ways of minimizing um, the extent of racism and its impact. And part of that is born of ignorance, and part of that is born of uh, motivation to not want to see things that would otherwise be obvious. And some of it is due to a mix. That is, we don't know things that we should know, because some people are motivated to keep us from knowing them. And so we have to go out of our way to find them. This is why you have debates about what goes into a history textbook, why you have um, state legislatures saying that we shouldn't teach uh, uh, ethnic studies in, in some spaces, why they're interrogating the, the curriculum of universities in different states um, exactly for that, for that reason. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if in closing, maybe we can talk about um, decolonizing um, a lot of spaces. I mean, I think that we've started talking about this implicitly, um, but maybe articulate it a little bit more clearly. So I know that Glenn, you are currently um, invested in one such effort in looking at decolonizing, if I may say so, um, psychology science. Um, but Cecile, I'm sure, has thought about it in a number of different other ways. And so perhaps that is a positive note to end our conversation on. Give us hope, please. <laughs> no, and we have to have hope as in as an instructor, as a mother of a 10 year old, as a human, you know, or we will all perish. But I also want people to be realistic. I want people to know that they don't have to do what they may think of as extraordinary things. I'm going to give like two examples. Um, before moving to Georgia, I, I was at um, University of Kansas. And one of my most memorable moment 
um, and I'm a single parent, so we will have after school, um, 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 after hours, I will say, um, program. And one program I went to, I had to take my son because it's so complicated. It was six or seven. One of my colleagues, white male, this is important for the story, who does work on, on race, um, he took my son and actually babysit him during the time because I was giving the presentation. The one may think, oh, that's not a big deal. That's such a powerful moment in his action. What he says is that it is okay for you to be here with your son. You belong. We are part of that. You are part of my community. And that he used his white male privilege to make me as a black woman with lots who speaks with an accent feel comfortable and feel like I own that space as well. I had the right to be there. I had the right to be there with my son. Because as a woman, if I didn't have my son, um, if having my son there, some people may think, oh, she didn't get her act together. Just as a woman, put aside the color and all that. But for him to do that, usually when male colleagues bring their children, people think they're awesome dads, they're great. It's like, oh, he's such a good father. This is the gender parts. This was what one of my colleagues did. And that still stay with me. To me, this is decolonizing space in action. You have to think of what can you do? Do you see another colleague in your class? Did you see somebody treat them a certain way after that? Did you just go to that, that peer and say, are you okay? I saw what happened. It could be, these are, you may think they're small acts, but it's a combination of small acts that make a big deal. So there is hope. There are things you can do no matter where you are. Use your privilege. Use your positionality. Decolonize the space with what you have. That sounds like good last words to me. I think we could leave it there. We could leave it there. I'm sure. Although you, you have ideas, you have thoughts, right? You're working on that. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I would say, first of all, I think it's important to amplify what um, Professor Asselian said that um, there, that often a lot of it, a lot of things have to do with a greater awareness of where one is and how one takes up space and how uh, things work. And all of us can learn more and be more attentive to the dynamics, I think. And uh, part of education is, is about that. And this is why approaching the, the potentially threatening topic with less defensiveness is a very important thing. Uh, to be open to becoming a better person, one needs to, to learn and accept the fact that one makes mistakes and, and this is how you learn is to, to engage them. Uh, you know, I would just, um, with respect to the idea of decolonizing, especially in, 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 in academic spaces, there are some people who definitely use that language in Afri academic spaces. Uh, so in the South African case, for example, there's a very strong movement toward decolonizing the university and part of the um, impetus or a more recent incarnation of that happened with the removal of his, the monument to uh, John Cecil Rhodes, who was a British imperialist, whose uh, monument stood at the, on the campus of the University of Cape Town until um, local activists there demanded the removal of the, the monument. Similar things going on in the United States, right? With the demands for the removal of these monuments that uh, stand, uh, they're there to project terror. They're there to project power. And uh, we can talk about you know, heritage, we can talk about uh, identity, but that heritage and identity is wrapped up in the projection of, of terror and power. So. Uh, those things exist in that space too. And, and, and even on the, the campus of the University of, Can of Kansas, where I teach, and, and I suppose at uh, JCCC, you can find some vestiges 
as well, as you mentioned at the beginning, even the name of the, of the county uh, has some of this. The only caution I would note with respect to the use of that word is um, that, that uh, as Eve Tuck, who is an Indigenous scholar at the University of Toronto, has written in several different places along with her colleague, Wang Yang, uh, this idea that, that uh, decolonization can sometimes function as a metaphor which, use, which renders it, um, which weakens it. So if we're talking about decolonizing the pet shop, uh, you can use it in those ways and um, maybe it's productive in some way, but in the end of the day, uh, if one is concerned about transformation of space, maybe uh, rethinking of ideas, that's not necessarily the language to use. But in any case, challenging and rethinking and, de and confronting the racism in inherent in ideas in space is uh, a desirable thing, regardless of what one calls it. Thank you. Thank you both so very much for your thoughts, your input on this very important topic. I think that we all leave this space now inspired to move forward and hopefully um, enact some of your ideas, um, being more mindful of who's around us and what is happening and certainly being devoted to educating ourselves. Thank you. Thanks, Christy, for doing the legwork behind the scene that makes this happen. Take technology. Thanks for the invite, Anne. Thank you, Glenn, for sharing your ideas. And thank, thank you, you to the attendees whom we cannot see. <laughs>